Welcome to a Healing Peace Podcast. We partner with J Intel, a nonprofit organization that provides educational programs to promote emotional and mental health while building our identity in Christ. In this podcast series, you will learn about me, Kimir Baker, the CEO and founder of J Intel, and other life changers. We inspire, equip, and support you along your journeys. By the renewal of our minds, we overcome life challenges. We renew and rise up. Welcome home, you guys. I don't know about you, but I was so excited to come back this week to keep talking to Karis as we've been delving in a little bit about life and faith and working through suffering. And so, Karis, can you reintroduce yourself to our lovely audience? Sure. So, yeah, my name is Karis Meyer. I live in Northern Virginia with my husband and four children. And we have been here for about four years. My husband's in the military, so we get to see a lot of the world and the country. And I, my bachelor's in Christian education, master's in counseling, and recently wrote a book called Suffering Redeemed. And yeah, I'll keep it at that for now. Sounds good. And you talked about being a military family. So what are one experience that you've had where it was just like, man, that was just such a treat. And I probably wouldn't have gotten it if my husband wasn't part of the military. Hmm. I don't know if I would say one particular experience, but I will say even though moving around is challenging, we have been blessed to meet so many wonderful people. We, we've we moved 12 times in 17 years, so it's been a lot of moving. But at the same time, like I said, it's just there's so many wonderful people in the world. And I do feel blessed that I've I've had the opportunity to meet people through all the moves. Yeah, that's pretty exciting. I enjoy traveling myself, and I think one of the things that really hits home for me is humanity, and no matter where I go, you still see pretty much the same struggles, and, and but maybe it's just a different language in terms of how they deal with their struggles, but at the end of the day, I'm like, oh man, we're so human, and I was like, if you got the same problem we have over here. How's that work? <laughs> Very true. And so I was like, God, I thought it was just us who was the crazy ones, but everyone needs God at some point. So I, I, I do appreciate you being forthcoming about that. And when we left off of the previous interview, you were doing such a wonderful job sharing about what you've learned and, and how, and what a, maybe advice per se that you would have given your younger self. And in your statement, you made a statement about not believing the lies. And so for yourself, what were some of the things or tools that you used to get you back to a place of truth so that those lies were not dictating how you continue to live? That's a great question. I think the main thing is to be renewing our minds day by day. There's a reason why (laughs) we we need to do it continually. It's not just a one-time thing, but there's the truth in the word of God is is so valuable. And it's amazing how how much untruth lies or just negative self-talk or just negativity in general, you know, that we we can think about and not even realize we're thinking. But one of the things is is to just be replacing that with the truth of God's word. And just like what Philippians, where Paul says, you know, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right and pure and lovely and excellent and praiseworthy, think about these things. And so there's so many things that we could be focusing on that would be uplifting. And really our brains control so much, you know, our, our minds and our brains are so powerful and they can either bring life to our bodies. They can either or they can bring death, right? They, they affect our emotions and our, our actual physical bodies. And so it's not just, it's not just 
contained in our in our, our thoughts. It it really affects our entire lives and, and how we come across to other people too. So that's one of the things. And then also is just declaring the promises of God that bring us hope and that bring us out of the mindset of, especially in if you're in a situation that seems like it's never going to end and that life is always going to be like this, there are so many promises. I mean, thousands of promises in the word of God that we can cling to, like simple things like putting them up around your house or on the screensaver on your phone or whatever you can do to be reminding yourself of these amazing things that we have in Christ and as God's children to be living by. Yeah, I've definitely had to grow and learn and and really be not just defensive, but like on the offense, you know, just kind of be prepared before it happens, before the lies come, you know, be <laughs> be ready. And that comes back to also like having the the armor of God, you know, which it talks about in Ephesians 6, just being prepared. We have to have the shield of faith and the sword of spirit, which is the word of God and the helmet of salvation and the breastplate of righteousness and the, you know, the belt of truth and all these things that it's such a picture of what this world is actually. You know, we, we are in a battle. It's not like we can just kind of mosey on and just kind of expect life to go easy because that's not how it's going to go. It's going to be hard and we need to be prepared for the battle. And we need to know that there is an enemy against our souls who, not that we should be living in fear every day, but we need to be prepared. Sure. And the things that you just shared, is that what has helped you through this journey as you've been waiting for your healing? Because it it sounds like it's actually a dumb question. I want to say yes, but I'm going to let you (laughs) respond to that. Yeah, I mean those are those are a few of the things. I would say just some of the very basic disciplines of being in the word daily. I mean, I get up every morning early before my kids are awake because I know I need to be in the word. I need I need to be refreshed. I need to, I need to, I need my daily bread before I can I can go on with the day. So or in worship, you know, that's something else that just sustains me is is being in worship is planning times where I can just be before the Lord in worship, scripture memory and prayer and fellowship. And, you know, just all these things that we know that seem simple, right? They seem like, oh, they're part of what we do as Christians, but but to actually make time for them and to make sure that they are part of our lives. I mean, honestly, that's what keeps me going is being disciplined in these areas and making sure I am around people who are following Jesus, who can encourage me, and also that I'm being filled up by the Lord on a daily basis. Yeah, and and that's so important. And no matter what stage of life, those principles are always needed, right? They don't ever go away. They're kind of like the basic foundation. And when I was reading your book, one of the things that I was curious about is how did you know this? Like, how did you understand that God was the source? And I didn't know if that came from being a child of missionary parents, but how was that seed of God planted in your being? And, and eventually, of course, we knew it grew because you're here today talking to us, but I I really was curious on the, on the seed planting aspect of who he is. I mean, I accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior as as a child, but it wasn't until I had some years in high school where I was definitely, I would say, kind of in rebellion and, you know, kind of doing my own thing. It wasn't until after my freshman year in college, I went away to a, a Bible school in Costa Rica. And it was that year where I learned so much, like the dependence upon the Holy Spirit, learning how to live by the spirit, not by my flesh, learning the word of God. So we did a a whole year of just learning the Bible and doing mission work, doing, you know, just back hard labor for different places there. But that was the year where my roots, like I fell in love with God, a relationship, a life giving, like I love God and he is the source of my joy and my strength. 
And I am so thankful because I don't, if I hadn't had that, I mean, I, I know that was the foundation, right? That was the foundation. And my life was still relatively, I would say, good. It was, it was pretty easy. I hadn't had a lot of trial at that point, but that's where the foundation of my, of my relationship of God started. Sure. And it must have been so powerful enough that throughout your experience with your health battle, you were able to not be like Job's friends when it was like, just curse God and die. Just curse him and kill him already. <laughs> and, and so I, I still, in my mind, I, I'm still quite blown away with your ability to cling to God in the midst of these trials. Like sometimes my brain just can't really comprehend it. And I know that, and especially for the length of your journey. So what has been something in the midst of all that where you saw God working and it gave you the opportunity to say, you know what, I'm going to keep holding on. I see him doing this. Mm. Did you ever have any of those type of experiences? God would often give me God knows what we need. It, it, need. It, it's, it's obvious. He doesn't always give us what we want. But in those times, I would say that I, I hit that place where I felt like I couldn't go on several times. And yet, whether it be through his word or a call from a friend or reading a book or a devotional or even dreams, I had several dreams, especially during some very difficult times where God spoke to me through the dream. And I was like, okay, God, just like a reassurance. Okay, God. God sees me. God knows. God is still here. He may not be answering the prayers that I'm asking, but he he would show up enough to show me, Harris, I'm here and I I am in control. And and so yes, and and there was one time and I write about this in my book too, but there was one time where I I my my pancreas was con- completely atrophied. It was it was not working. I had to go to the Mayo Clinic in Minnesota. And when I got there, it was healed. And so I see God healed me in that instance, which I'm like, why did he heal that? But not everything else. But right. but yet yeah. I am so thankful that he did because your pancreas is pretty important. <laughs> so come to find out. <laughs> so and, and even like I mentioned, the, our four children who are such a blessing to me. I mean, yes, there's a lot of work, but I... I know the doctors told us we wouldn't be able to have children and now we have four. And so that's another place where I see God just, he just gave us what we didn't deserve. And then another thing is just that the fruit of the Holy Spirit that I see in my life, like joy when I, I, I'm I'm like completely in, in despair and, and God gives me joy. And I know it's not from me or from my circumstances, it's, it's from him. And so I'm like, okay, God, (laughs) you're doing it. It's, I can't do this. And so, yeah, I think there's several areas where, again, like I say, like a a lot of times when I pray things and he doesn't answer the way, but he knows what we need and he'll give us what we need, not always what we want, but he'll show us. He's a good father who wants to draw us to himself and to reassure us of his presence. Yeah. And I'm so glad that you shared that aspect of his character because it is so easy just to get stuck in the circumstance piece that we don't see him working and we're blinded to his working. And then because we're blinded to it, our inner thoughts, our inner critique escalates, escalates to the point where we're not in the place of joy or happiness or even being able to completely function because we're so consumed with those negative thoughts and thinking that God has abandoned us. And especially in the sense of dealing with health, because I'm pretty wimpy when it comes to health. So again, I think that's why I'm, I'm so amazed by your story and your experiences, because I know the resilience that it takes to keep pushing forward. And just to hear, not only are you pushing forward, but you're allowing God to lead the way. And so that that's so encouraging. And, and just seeing his provision, even though it's not exactly how we think it should be, you, you still are able to see his provision. Do you feel like you're stuck in a rut and can't seem to move forward? 
If so, you're not alone. Millions of people struggle with emotional and health challenges every year. However, we believe that everyone deserves to live a happy and fulfilling life, and we are here to help you get there. J-I-N-T-E-L, J-I-N-T-E-L, now offers coaching services. Receive these benefits when you book a session. Increase self-awareness, improve communication skills, increase confidence, reduce stress, and improve relationships. If you're ready to take the next step, please go to J-I-N-T-E-L dot org slash services to book a free consultation. And so in terms of, because I know there's a, a latter aspect of your book where you're talking about the hope and the surrender and the peace. Can you walk us through a little bit in terms of how can we gain that as we are in that waiting period? Yeah. So I struggled a lot with feeling this tension between being fully surrendered to God and what he was allowing in my life. And also having faith that he is the God of miracles, who can heal, who can deliver, who can do anything beyond our understanding, beyond measurably more than we can ask or imagine. And I felt sometimes like I had to choose, like, how do I pray? How do I pray into this situation? How do I be fully surrendered to God's will and what he is allowed, but also trust him fully or being full of, you know, faith and hope that God would heal me. And I... I felt like I was failing at both. I was like, oh, I just felt like it was a pendulum that I'd like swing back and forth. And the more I prayed into it, you know, I felt these two words. I remember it was around Christmas time several years ago that it was these two words, peaceful expectation kind of just came to me. And I was thinking about how, like God was just revealing to me that it's possible to do both. It's possible to be fully expectant, full of faith, Sometimes I would just like imagine God doing these amazing things. Like I could see it. It's so tangible to me. And in the stories in the Bible, I can, you know, just imagine how how God is so powerful. And I've seen God heal people. I've seen, I've seen that happen. And at the same time, live in this place of complete, humble surrender and say, okay, God, I don't understand. I don't like this, but this is where I'm at. There is tension, but It's also a place where we can be at peace. Right. And one of the things that you pinpointed, which I'm glad that you did, is the honesty. Like you were honest with God. And I think sometimes in our circumstances, we stop being honest because we don't want to appear to be bad. But in that honesty, not only are we able to release all those things, but it gives us an opportunity to allow someone bigger to take the responsibility of those things. Because again, going back to the God complex, I can do it. I can fix it. I know I can. <laughs> to which we all know it don't actually work that way. So, <laughs> so yeah. And I want I do want to share one thing with our audience because this is probably the first interview where you heard me refer to a book so many times. And and I know before I had one person who listened who was turned off by someone talking about a book all the time. And here I'm doing it. I want to give you my disclaimer up front. I'm aware. But the reason why I'm talking about it so much is because it moved me tremendously. And when something moves me, I try to tell everybody about it. I was like, you got to go read it. You got to go see it for yourself. And so, so you're, you're hearing my enthusiasm in terms of how Karis has been able to articulate her journey and being able to connect those dots with God being on that journey, even though she doesn't always have the outcome that she's hoping for in that specific moment. And so as I shared in the last interview, there were many moments where I was crying through it because I saw how conditional I've been in my walk with God and getting me back to a place of purity with him where when you you think of a parent-child relationship in the beginning, when they don't know anything, the the reliance that they have on their parents and and that that level of, I'm just going to hold on to you because I feel protected and cared for. And when I was reading the book, that 
that's the place that it brought me back to where it's like, oh, you're that child and, and here is my dad so powerful who just wants to hold and guide me through these experiences. So that's my disclaimer. That's why I keep talking about it. And of course, you can go pick it up for yourself at Amazon. It's called Suffering Redeemed. And I, I went on a tangent myself. I apologize. I'm going to come back from my tangent. So I, I did have another question because I know that we're human. And what I was sharing with you before we started the interview was me working through my sensitivity and my emotional aspect of hearing my mom have a, a bad day with her health. Ooh, it just ruffles my feathers. And so I, I know that you talked about having that community there to support you and to guide you. But what advice would you give to a person who is outward seeing someone go through all these hardships? What advice would you give them to help or support in a, in a healthy way? Great question. There's a chapter in my book too called For the Loved Ones because I've had so many people ask me that over the years. And something is so interesting is people really want to help, but most times people are uncomfortable, unless you know the person really well. Most people are uncomfortable with suffering, especially if it's something that they're not used to or like know a lot about. You know, so if someone says they have some kind of illness or if someone died in their family, if they're struggling with some type of mental illness or emotional issue, whatever, oftentimes people kind of freeze. Oh, I don't know what to say. I don't want to say the wrong thing. And so then they just kind of don't say anything at all, which makes the person feel more isolated, which I know is not the intention. But the first thing I would say is just try to ask questions. You know, if, if the person doesn't want to talk, I think they'll, they'll tell you but it really means a lot to a person when they're in pain because oftentimes they can feel alone. They can feel like they're the only ones. One thing that I learned through writing this book is how many people told me, I haven't told anyone how much pain I am in. You know, I feel like I'm the only one. When you're in, in that place, it can feel very lonely. And so to allow when somebody else comes and offers to, to be with you, you know, just to be present with you in your pain is very powerful. It's, it's, it's a gift to just be there, to listen, to, to kind of take some of that burden by, by just listening and asking questions and trying to, trying to understand. So it's, it takes getting informed. Sometimes it, there's something specific you can do to help. And so that's good to ask too. It's like, can I help you in any way? Can I, can I bring food? Can, is there something practical can I, that I can do? And I know a lot of times people say, you know, I'll pray for you. But just pray with them. When people have offered to pray for me and with me, like especially when they're like, let's just pray together right now. I have a friend, a dear friend who, I don't know how she get, doesn't get tired of it, but she's like, I'm going to pray for you again, like, and again, and again, and again. Every time I'm with her, she's like, let's just pray. Let's pray together. I'm going to pray for you. And I'm like, Sharon, don't you get tired of praying for me? And she's, she's like, no, I'm going to keep praying for you. We're in this together. It's just so powerful. It's so powerful when you feel like someone else is there with you. And so that's the biggest thing I would say is just provide a loving hand and a shoulder to cry on and sh express express your empathy and your and your care for that person. Sure, sure. And as I'm looking at the time, we've, we've talked so much. <laughs> so I appreciate having people on the show who can talk a lot just like me <laughs> it, does, <laughs> it does make things a lot easier they're like girl I'm here you talking I was like but it wasn't just me this time so there you go <laughs> and so I share that with as we're coming to a close of, of this wonderful interview again I thank you for your time for both interviews do you have any lasting words or closing words to our audience well I would just say that God is for you he is for you. He is not against you. Sometimes it can feel like God has forgotten us, that he doesn't see us. But God, he is, whatever situation you are in, he is for you. He's on your side. He's fighting for you. He's a God who fights our battles. He's a God. I just, the most amazing thing I think is that Jesus intercedes for us. He intercedes for us in our, in our pain and our problems. 
he is interceding for us, which is just so beautiful. So just remember that. And you're not alone. We have the Lord, we have the Holy Spirit. We we have each other and and don't don't be afraid to reach out. Don't be afraid to reach out to to the person next to you, to the person across the street from whoever. You know, there's there's people who want to help, who want to be with you in your pain. You just need to reach out. I feel like that's a drop the mic statement. So that you're not suffering alone. Uh, there, there's no benefit for suffering in silence. You, you never get to that in place that you're looking for in the sense of reprieve or release when it's in silence. And so I, I think you've done a, a great job of expressing just the benefit of being in a community or being willing to be vulnerable and and seeing in the process what God will do with that. So as I stated before, I appreciate you being on our show and, and just sharing your experiences with us. And I so totally will continue or be one of your friends who pray for your deliverance, but knowing that in the interim, I just want to say thank you for your courage to share who you are and share how God has been in your life. And so within that, you guys, you know what we're going to do next week. We're going to have our wonderful tools and tips show, where we're going to try and put some, to like some of these great things. So you can have opportunities to put things into practice in your everyday life. I thank you so much for listening to us and being a part of our conversation. And until then, I will see you next week.